Patrick Dennis, what's up, man? Not much, not much. Just tired of the heat outside. But other than that, it's yeah. not a whole lot going on. <laughs> yeah, you're. Uh, I'm sure you're getting all kind of questions and stuff about these random. I wanted to talk to you about that later on. With the, these random storms we were getting in the middle of July, man, it's crazy. This is uh, unprecedented. Uh, I've not dealt with storms like this in the middle of the summer. That's before. what I was going to ask you. Have you ever seen like anything like this? And why do you think they're coming about anyways? Well. Like, uh, you know, this is a year that we say El Nino, which is basically a term used for the warming of the Pacific Ocean waters. And the ocean waters affects what our weather happens to be. So that could be one reason for it. I'm not going to get into the big debate of climate change. I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> Look, it's, 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 it's like this because for some reason or other, that is a, uh, you know this too because you, you keep up with things. That That's one of those terms that triggers people. Yeah, yeah. And so is climate change real? Absolutely, it's real. Uh, but how much we have an influence on it, nature has an influence on it, that's completely up for debate. Still. It is hard to say, right? Because there's 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 so many like like documentation of history over, you know, the course of how far we can look back. Oh, yeah. They've seen these, uh, you know, changes where things aren't, weren't really, we weren't doing anything, it was just happening. It, uh, weather goes in cycles. Yeah. Everything goes in cycles. Uh, I find like right now, they say every single day for the past, I don't know, 10 days, something like that, that uh, we've set a new global record for for high temperatures in the world, global record. Like like we're the, the earth is the warmest it's ever been. But remember, those records only date back several decades. Right. <laughs> so right. Uh, it's ever been as far as we can look back in this one but, period of time. But, but throw that all out of the equation here yeah. in our lives and in, in, in our life. Yes, this is something that is is, is new to us. Yeah. I mean, the, the 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 amount of how I mean, I'm about to say how hot it's been, but in actuality, as the time we're sitting here right now doing this, uh, we had not we actually haven't hit 100 degrees this year, officially okay. at the Shreveport Regional Airport. We haven't hit 100 degrees. Okay, but you're saying, wait, it's been hot. It has been hot. Heat advisories are out for the area, right. so you know that that last year by this time, I can't tell you, we've already hit 100 several times. So, right, that's what I was thinking because I've experienced like hotter temperatures, and especially not yeah. in this area, but mm -hmm. in other areas. Mm -hmm. And like everyone keeps saying, "Well, this record temperatures." I'm like, "But I don't. I've seen hotter." You know, for me, yeah, you know? yeah. But you see, now out western part of the U.S., they're underneath what they call that heat dome, that's upper ridge. I mean, it's what I call the ring of fire. Underneath it, it feels like a fire, and on the outside of it, that's where we have the storms, and that's where we've had all of our bad weather this year is because that upper ridge has been sitting there and we are right on the eastern side of it and it directs it directs the, the winds come around the edge of it and it pushes those storms into our area yeah because i've noticed like a pattern like i feel like it's like every week you see that drifting from like the uh, oklahoma, oklahoma area, area mm -hmm. and then running down yep. and then coming right across north louisiana that is exactly what's been going on and it's just the placement of that upper ridge this year that has really been the uh achilles hill for us uh with it because it has been shoving those storms into our area with it and we have have to get, see a break you, the way you see a break is the ridge needs to shove all the way out west or it needs to come park itself on top of us and give us record heat okay yeah so you know that's that's what it is but i'll be honest with you seeing the storms with these power outages that we've had yeah. uh i'll just say this much i'm glad i'm probably not at swepco anymore i've spent four months four or five months there last year and i know that they're dealing with a lot of headaches right now a lot of great people there but uh you know this this has been an unusual thing for us no yeah doubt. because it's like we're not used to getting these types of storms in this in this time of year so it's no. like you're getting these storms and it's knocking out power and then people are without power at you know record temperatures right and, and the, i was having this conversation also with somebody else it might have been yesterday or the day before normally this time of the year we're dealing with what we call sea breeze storms so if you go to the beach and you know in the morning time the beach you will have some storms they'll move in off the coast and they'll start coming northward and then usually the beach itself it stays pretty quiet most of the day because all the storms are inland that's because they pushed inland well that's normally what we see this time of the year or we see tropical activity yeah uh but this year hasn't been the case for us and so the we might have to get a little break down the road uh i just look at it like this it is now getting towards the second half of july which means typically speaking we got about another month or so of the extreme heat. Then hopefully after that, we'll start to see things quiet down I, for us. Do you get tired of hearing people say, oh, I can't wait till it to get hot. I can't wait for it to get cold. Like, I feel like I hear they people do. say that all the time. They, like, they do. <laughs> and, and, my, and mine is, it's like, Patrick, when's it going to get cool again? And my sarcastic response is October. Yeah. Usually, I mean, I mean, because here we can get cool snaps in September, but they're not major. October we start to get a little bit better of some cool snaps. But again, it'll be interesting to see what this year's like. Well, so tell me how you got into all this. How long have you been doing this? And, um, you know, tell me about, you know, and people who are listening or watching not necessarily are in this area we're right. in. So 
they may not know who you are. A lot of people around here do know who you are, yeah. but abroad they do not. So let's just talk about that. Okay, so uh, I should have brought the props with me. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> what's funny was I did a presentation somewhere not too long ago and I had to put together a PowerPoint. And I was like, okay, look, we're gonna put together this PowerPoint and I wanna tell people how I got started in this. And there were two books uh, that, I, that I had when I was a little kid. And uh, one, I tell people this probably all started back when I was in second grade. And I just had a fascination with weather because I guess I was scared of it. And so there was at the time in the mall, and that's when you could go to malls a lot back yeah. then, there was a bookstore there and it was called Walden's Bookstore. And uh, I don't even know if they're still in existence today. So I got me a little weather book there with it. Then my grandmother who lived with us, she went to the library all the time because that's what people did. You, you didn't even have cable television back then. And so I'd go to the library and there was a Time Life book. So there's Time Magazine, Life Magazine, and some people may not even know about those. Well, they put out book publications and there was a book I'd always go check out. So I would go get those books there, check them out. And I actually found them on Amazon recently and I ordered me copies of them. So I still, so I have them now. But that's just really it. I, I was scared of weather and I went to college and I said, I thought to myself, I'm gonna be a weatherman one day. Then I went to college and it was like, you know what's cool? Being a sports caster. I'm gonna do sports, man. Okay. So I went to uh, I went to uh, graduate school at Stephen F. Austin in Nacogdoches, Texas. And uh, I was like over the uh, news department there on campus. So I started and created my own outdoor, not my own sports show called The Bunkhouse. And I called The Bunkhouse because it was the Lumberjacks. Yeah. And so did that. So I thought to myself, okay, I'm gonna get me a job doing sports. So. There was a job opening uh, at a station here in town, so I went to it. And it was my first first job. It was at KTAL, and uh, I went there to it. And I said, "Okay, I'm interested in this job." They said, "Nah, we sort of have somebody in mind, but we have this weather job." And I said, "Okay." I said, "Fine." So I did the weather job, got into that. I guess you say uh, the rest was history. Uh, stayed doing weather. Uh, I only stayed there for about a year and a half. Then I went to KSLA for ten years. Became chief meteorologist there eventually. Uh, left, made this, uh, what I call sometimes the dumbest decision in my life, <laughs> and, you know, started my own business and did things. And I was just like, I look back at it and I, I'm like, I don't regret my time at channel 12. I just had this thing about me that I said, you know what? I want to do my own thing. So I did that. And then, uh, what was that? A year later, uh, the, uh, I guess it was 2008 when the economy took a turn with it. I actually got offered jobs by both KTOL and KTBS to come work for them. I took the KTOL job at the time, stayed there for 10 years. Uh, then I was uh, not there anymore for three months. I did a little work in Waco, Texas. And then uh, George uh, Servan, our GM at the station, uh, reached out to me when he found out I needed a job. And uh, he reached out to me and he found me a place there. And uh, you know, I, I would say be, been there ever since. I, got, I left last year for about four or five months to go work for Swepco, but uh, that just didn't quite work out perfectly for me. So I wound back up and didn't think I'd be chief meteorologist again, but uh, here I am now. Yeah, That's a long version, short version, however it is you want to look at it. But that, <laughs> well, that, that's my main job that I do now. With that stuff, like, so first off, the new, how does it work with like local news versus like nationwide news? So you have all these networks like ABC, mm -hmm. NBC, mm -hmm. Like, but then you have these acronyms. Well, how does that even work? Like you have these like, like act, act like KTBS, KTAL, yeah. how does all that work? I've just never really even looked into that. Uh, you know, they all, I guess for some of them, how they get those, uh, I, there might be certain things they look at with it. Like if you look at uh, KTAL, if you think more than likely, T, Texas, A, Arkansas, gotcha. L, Louisiana. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, SLA, KSLA, I'm not really sure, but I'm assuming the LA part of it yeah. is. Uh, gosh, what is TBS on that part there? Now you're asking me that. Uh, well, I just like these things. Have, uh, Hopefully uh, nobody at work sees this one. <laughs> Patrick doesn't know this one here. Well, I randomly think about BS, those things. BS part there, not standing for that BS part right. there. Broadcasting system. Gotcha. So I'm thinking about what the T stands for. But you know, here's what's funny though. KTBS is one of the only, I'm not really sure if it's the only or not, one of the only locally owned family owned tv stations left in this country how does that work they just partner with lo well, like like nationwide they get bought well so a lot of stations get you know sometimes it's it's a uh, corporation that has different stations and yeah. they get bought up they get bought up they get bought up like uh ktal is the next star station okay uh gotcha. ksla i believe now is a gray station and uh ktbs is still ktbs that's cool so it's it, locally owned it's the owned only by one the ray, in this uh, area owned by the ray family and it's the only one in this area locally it's the, it's the only one maybe in the entire country really yeah i mean it's rare to have that and so they're still locally owned uh with it and you know 
I jokingly said to my boss one day when I came back, I told him, I said, look, I'm looking for my future. I said, are we going to stay locally owned or not? And uh, he says, they're staying locally owned. He says, there, there's always offers, but though, no, this is. Yeah, I would think you're always getting chased by offers oh, or something oh my like gosh. that. You yeah, know? and probably some good deals sometimes, but though it is the only, I mean, like I said, it's one of the only, if not the only one still in existence today. And that that's a rarity. Yeah. Well, so you, you were doing meteorology work for so long, like there for so long. And then, then what happened, like, where you got into, you do other things too. Yeah. Like, you, but like what, I want to talk about like this huge turn of events when social media kind of started interjecting into the, the television yeah. broadcast thing. Like what, what was that like? Like experiencing that and, and how you share, share information and news versus what you, how you used to. So whenever uh, social media first came about, they they would say to us uh, sometimes they would say Patrick you need to go and I, I can't remember what station it was at was that this has been several years ago you need to post on uh, you need to make sure you post on this here on Facebook do this here on the web that yeah. kind of thing I'm like oh wait a minute time out my number one job priority is that television station is to do the weather on that and but things have changed a lot you know back back then if there was breaking news going on you didn't jump on social media and do it because you wanted people to tune in to watch your newscast right. and uh, but that's all changed. If you have breaking news now and you do it, you go and you break that news as soon as you can. And that is using social media and doing it. And I think our fear was a long time ago, you didn't do it because you didn't want the other station to find out about the story. Because gotcha. if you did it, then all of a sudden they found out about it and they may not have been covering it. Well, that's changed too, right? Because all the, it's all, it's all, <laughs> all the whole spectrum's changed. It's all changed. Out. Now, if you aren't first on social media or the web or something like that, then you're last, obviously, yeah. there. But but you want to be first there with it. I, I, I'll give you a quick example. Like uh, this past weekend, we had uh, the storms blow up on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I think to myself, I said, where are our viewers right now? They're outside enjoying things. They're mm -hmm. not sitting in their house. And they went to outside to do things because they said, oh, there's a chance for storms, but I'm still going to do stuff. Well, these storms blew up into a lot of severe storms. So I'd driven over to Bayou Door Cheat over there because I knew it was uh, had some high water on. I wanted to go see it. Well, I got, got started driving over there, and I realized I got a lot of severe storms heading towards me. So I get over there to Bayou Door Cheat, and I said, where are the people right now? Are they watching television, or are they out somewhere, but they have their phones with mm -hmm. them? I said, I'm going to do Facebook Live there. And I did Facebook Live there with it. I think I did three different Facebook Lives. One before I left the house, one at Bayou Door Cheat, and one sitting in Houghton there while the storm was just pounding down on top of me there. And I was on Facebook Live the whole time. And I did it because you need to take the weather information or the news, whatever it is, that people need to know about to the primary source you think you can reach them at at that particular time. Yeah. And that's where it was right there with it. I looked back afterwards and I looked back at my feed uh, with it. And I looked at the other stations, to be honest with you, and I said to myself, I did the right thing. Why? Because not a single other station was doing that on Sunday. And so you, you have to take it. So social media has changed everything with it, good and bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because you're going to get all the, all the, <laughs> all the public, you know, haste and you know oh, yeah. talk on there that you know you wouldn't get from a news you know and especially when you do facebook TV. lives and other yeah. things i'll yeah. just go back and we're not talking politics here at all right, I'll just right. give a quick example you go all the way back to the uh the last election and i guess that was 2020 whenever yeah. it was so the day after the last election nothing had been called yet and that morning i wasn't doing weather then i was a i was just reporting stuff and i was doing the uh, morning show live shots and I was in the studio standing in front of what we call our touch screen at the time, and it's, an, it's a, a, a map showing election results on it. And so what we were trying to do is, is basically say, well, if this happens here, then this person wins. If this happens here, this person wins. And just because I was up there saying, if this happens, if this happens, <laughs> I get called out for having certain political views. And I'm just like, wait, what? It's just, it's, it's just so crazy now. Uh, you man. can't do anything yeah. without being labeled one way yeah. or the other way with yeah. it. And so, and look, we could have, we, we could have five hour long conversation on comments that on Facebook, oh, I've yeah. learned one thing. <laughs> I just have to go. And I, I try to tell people that are new in the business. I tell them, you're going to need to get a thick skin real fast. And number two, when you do those Facebook Lives or anything, don't read the comments. That, Just I think that's move a, on. I, I think that's a very, <laughs> very, um, I think that's very smart. I don't think, like, especially, like, you're there as a utility, right? You're using yeah. it as a utility. You're using it to share information that's vital information right. that's important. And um, you shouldn't be going back worrying about what someone said about yeah. what you're literally, you know, 
displaying as this happened i need right. to share it you know what i mean but I, I i will tell you this those those most recent really bad storms where we had the power outages for mm -hmm. you know people 10 15 days whatever um i just so happened to be um barbecuing that night because i had an event the next yeah. day and i was up all night so it was like 2 a.m and i watched you live like yeah. you went live and you you were up all night dealing with that yeah. and what i thought was very interesting and also i think is very informative and what what's cool about what you're doing now and the platforms we use is that as you were reporting these storms coming in these areas all these people from all these different areas are saying okay our power's out here in mansfield mm -hmm. our power's out, out here yeah. and i think it was cool because it's like real-time news alongside what you're doing you're saying yeah. like the storms are moving here in this area and then people are also giving you a in instant feedback yeah. which is awesome i think you know because it's just mm -hmm. letting everyone know even more in depth of what's going on uh, yeah and I, and I try to encourage people to do that that way it, it helps out the other people to get an idea of what the storm is actually like yeah. in a particular area uh you know what we did what happens sometimes though we get there and it's like a, a, an outline for people what i'm going to talk about and I start talking about it, and then I say, okay, there's a line of storms that stretches all the way from Arkansas or Northeast Texas all the way down into Texas, and it's moving east, so it's gonna impact every area in Northwest Louisiana. And then all I get after that, what time's gonna hit Cushada? When's it gonna hit this place? <laughs> it's gonna hit my, I'm like going, and I have to be not sound like a smart aleck and all that, because I just don't have time to get into all of yeah. it. I say, I say, so listen to me. If you're in Louisiana, the storm's headed your way. Yeah. Plain and simple, uh, they're, they're with it. But yeah, that night too, I drove home and I did Facebook Live trying to drive home that night afterwards. And, I, and so I've taken people along. There was, I mean, I can't, there was so many people still up and watching the feed whenever I was driving home. And I told them, I said, okay, when I get to this road here, if there's gonna be a tree down, this is exactly where the tree's gonna be down. Got to it, tree's down. Okay. <laughs> so then I went around, I said, let me take this back way. I get around, I get almost to the ha I get almost to the neighborhood and I get there to it trees down power lines like great when if i went with the normal way home that night i would have got made it home but i yeah. was trying to go different ways to see the damage and i'll tell you what i mean shreveport police caddo sheriff's office deputies that night they were out cleaning streets and all the still raining outside cleaning streets people were already outside picking up stuff i did get to my neighborhood i barely got in the neighborhood trees down but my biggest fear was uh and this is i mean I, look i was literally scared that night because my family was at the house my wife and one of my daughters was at, they happened to be there at the house and the thing of it was was that uh whenever they were at the house they went and uh we have trees in our backyard and the way the storm's coming in the, they would have gone right on top of the house and uh but fortunately, not a single one of our trees got messed up. We yeah. lost tree limbs for it. But uh, I, I try to tell people, don't worry about all the time. Is it a tornado warning? If your phone yeah. goes off, because now they have it set for these severe thunderstorm warnings, that if the potential is there for 80 mile an hour winds, they, they issue what they call a destructive warning. And then that makes your phone go off. And when that phone goes off, you better take that storm seriously and treat it just like a tornado. Well, I do feel like that, yeah, I'm more worried about severe thunderstorms than I am tornadoes now, but what's the worst, worst one you've ever seen? Like, like, and I, when I say seen, like not, not necessarily just report, but actually yeah. have seen like firsthand or you experienced it or, you, I, you know, I've, I've been real lucky. I haven't experienced anything extremes in that case. That night there was a semi extreme night. Yeah. There was another storm system back in the mid, I uh, think 95 or 96. I'm dating myself there on it, but, uh, I remember it, it was a similar style situation, but it was with a cold front probably in the spring or something. And it moved across the Arklatex and, uh, we don't really know if this is true or not. That did level trees all across the area. But they claim that at Barksdale Air Force Base, the wind speed was documented at 144 miles an hour. That'd be the strength of a basically a major hurricane. That's insane. Yeah, so we don't really know if that if something happened with it, but I do remember that day there uh, with doing that. Uh, you know, I'm trying to think of other things. I, I technically have never been in a tornado before i've had to report on tornadoes one of the biggest outbreaks i've ever reported on was uh april it was easter sunday 2000. was that the benton stuff was that, that actually the the benton storm that that uh there was a, well there's been a couple of benton storms there was a benton storm that hit just on the north side of bozier between bozier and yeah. benton that hit a uh you know uh mobile home park yeah. there i think killed seven people yeah. that was that was, uh, if I remember correctly, the Saturday before Easter, 1999. Okay, well, what was the one? You're, sorry, I didn't mean to cut I'm you off. Ta I'm talking about the one that's in April of 2000. Okay. And that day there, we had six supercell storms. It wasn't a line of storms. It was six individual storms. And I'd driven up to Arkansas that morning to pick up my wife and my da daughter, who is now 25. 
and I went to pick them up to bring them back home. And uh, they'd gone up there Easter weekend. I said, I got to get up there early. We have a severe weather threat. And as we're driving back, I'm looking up to see these cloud formations. We call them mammatus clouds. They indicate instability in the atmosphere and all. And so we're driving back. And I didn't realize at the time, but it's like as I'm driving back, almost every one of those we passed up not long after that, a tornado moved through that area. Mm. There were like a little line of them. And they came through, dropped my, uh, talk, I think, guess Kristen dropped me off at the station. This is when I worked at KSLA. I said, go back home and uh to the house and so we go there and so then i look and see there's a storm moving right towards our house so i'm trying to get in touch with her she doesn't answer her phone i think we had a cell phone at the time <laughs> uh, neighbors were outside playing around i call her up and i said where are you i told you to go straight home she goes i'm in the drive through at mcdonald's getting the abby chicken nuggets i said she goes i said but i told you to go straight home with it and she was like well i thought we had time for this but they got home and then right after that another storm developed moved right over Cross Lake and hit near the TV station. We lost power and all that. But that was probably one of my most fascinating times. Also, I've dealt with uh, hurricanes, you know, Hurricane Rita, Hurricane Laura. Uh, with that, I've been down to New Orleans before, not for a major hurricane with it. It was Hurricane Danny, made have about 80 mile an hour winds. And then probably the most unique event overall, you've experienced it yourself, was what we call Snowmageddon. Yeah. <laughs> totally different. I, I, I like seeing snow in the area. Never want to live that again. I'll tell you that Is much. that the worst you've seen? Uh, as far as extreme like that? Like yeah. snow? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Whenever, I mean, whenever it snows here and it stays iced over for basically four or five days, I mean, yeah, that's that, that's one of the worst. Of well, stuff. that's the most I've ever seen, like, snow. Yeah, and it's we now, kept snow on the ground. Well, you know? snow accumulation-wise, probably one of the best I've seen before was the uh, Independence Bowl snow. Oh, yeah, I remember that, too. And yeah. the funny that, thing— I, was, I think I was there. Yeah. I believe I was there, yeah. Yeah, and the funny one. part about that was, now that I think about it, I said that storm was April 2000— that I think I want to say that was 2000 also I want that might have been yes that was that was actually uh New Year's Eve December 31st the year 2000 yep I'm gonna have to look back at all my records 2000 may go down yeah. as one of those most unique years Y2K you think about. man yeah th well that's yeah that was the next thing yeah you know, dealing with that. <laughs> and, and still, what was that like in the in reporting the news during that, uh, that time? <laughs> every, everybody every, everybody was like worried about stuff we got to back up the servers do all this stuff with it and so as in we could have if anything happened what could we do anyways you know that's what I mean? right like, <laughs> and, it's just it's 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 crazy it's it's really crazy with it and you um you also like there's so much i want to talk about on all that stuff but I'll, i don't want to leave this part out too you also do um do outdoor stuff like you have an outdoor yeah. channel how did you get into that it was it was weird so you know i told you earlier i left uh ksla to start my own video production business right. and i did that video production business started up there going with it and uh I, have, I can have all kinds of weird stories to tell you about that. But uh, I went on for a short period of time. I became the spokesperson for Roundtree Ford. Okay. And did, did that. Ken Shapin, uh, whose son uh, whose son is the quarterback now over at Baylor, and, uh, and one of his sons. And Ken now has a dealership over in Marshall, Texas. But I, I met up with him. It was really weird. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I left work, didn't have a clue. My wife, show, show you how crazy we were. My wife and I, we said, how can we pull this off? We said, well, we bought a tea business. Now, what I mean by that is we delivered and sold tea to restaurants. Okay. Gotcha. And we told them the tea leaves. Yeah. So they brew it themselves there to the restaurant. And uh, so we said, okay, we're going to sustain our income doing that because we got some clients with it. And then we'll start video production. So I had a few clients I'm building up and then I built up more clients. And then Ken, I met Ken Shape and I was shooting video, producing a video for his, his kid's t-ball team. The next thing you know, he met me, we introduced, talked to each other. And then he says, talk to me. So then I took over production. No, actually first I took over spokesperson, then production, did, that, did all that. So I grew the video production business. So we did it there uh, with it. it, it started growing. And I was doing some other videos before then too, wedding videos. Uh, and, and, and with it, don't do that anymore. Uh, I could tell you a lot of stories about that too. <laughs> but uh, but it, 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 it grew up, it was a de it's a decent business. And uh, But then I went to go work for KTAL, so I still did my stuff, still did my video production stuff and going on. Then one day back around 2013 or 14, I had this wild idea and I said, you know what? We're the sportsman's paradise. And you've probably met some people and you're doing your different things, but we don't have a single locally produced television show in the outdoors that's strictly produced to air locally. Mm -hmm. Now, not to take any credit away from the, there's some other individuals here in this town, in this area that produce outdoor shows. 
Uh, but they produced their outdoor shows originally for the purpose of airing nationally. Gotcha. And then nowadays, sometimes they air them locally. And I know people who've worked for these different entities, and they put out some great stuff. I'm friends with one of them, uh, Greg Hall up uh, north of here. He he has one. Uh, you know, uh, Rock Bordelon, he has one. Uh, there's a group of guys in, uh, over at uh, associated with Houghton, uh, the Baptist Church over there. Yeah. They have, and I'm just naming three. There could be right. very easy right. more. But mine was going to be the first one for our area. Uh, really, there, there's somebody else too that had one, but uh, theirs was pretty much not going to be in existence anymore. So I went to the TV station. I said, "Hey, I got this idea." I said, "Would you guys be interested in, uh, you know, uh, I guess basically selling the show, and I'll put it together, I'll do stuff with it." And they were like, "No, we don't have the manpower for it." And I said, "Okay, if not, is it okay if I do it? Sure, you can do it." So I went out and sold it. I went out, and got my sponsors for it. I went out, and started producing content for it and doing it, and uh, and you know going with it and it was just about two or three months afterwards uh somebody here uh chip that has hoot and holler archery because i was doing stuff with him at the time he says patrick he goes uh he goes do you know cody brazil with uh bayou outdoor super center and i said i said no and he goes well i want you to talk to him he says he's interested in talking to you about your show i go really so i went and i sat down and talked to him and uh you know they said that they were associated with this other show but they just weren't getting what they were getting out of it. And this was a show, the one I said, that was uh, not going to be really in existence anymore anyway. And uh, I said, sure. And I said, you know what? My name, my show is called Outdoors 365. I said, your business is called Bayou Outdoors. Yeah. So what if I gave you the title to it and we did all this stuff with it? And they said, sounds good. I said, okay. So uh, did that there with it. And be honest with you, with uh, the rest is history when it comes to them. I've, uh, the, the Brazil family is like family to me. Uh, they've treated me right uh, for all the years, even ups and downs. COVID hit. Uh, we did away with the show for a month, went back to them, got them back on board with it. And uh, just uh, just amazing people. They're an amazing family. And uh, so the outdoor show has grown. Uh, I try to nowadays do partnerships with people. I have to think outside the box a little bit differently. Yeah, because there's so many people producing their own, their own yeah. you know, content. And yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I can see where it has been, you know, has changed as well. I try to find out whenever I go get a sponsor for the show, I say to him, I said, I said, I say, you're a perfect fit for me. I'll give you an example. Sabine Parish Tourism, Toledo Bend Country. Perfect fit. Of course. DeSoto, yeah. DeSoto Parish Tourism, Sabine River. Yeah. Perfect fit. Yeah. Uh, Shreveport Bozier Sports Commission, archery tournaments, dog events the great outdoors everybody knows the value of outdoor tourism nowadays yeah so i say hmm i can come and produce this stuff for my show and then you know what you can have it yeah and why do not that there. i mean that's that's the I, best I way try, to cross market because you see you see I, I don't run a video production business outside anymore with it because of where i work at a television station and i'm doing that but i try to find partnerships where I can find it, create a win-win situation. It's not so much me going out saying, sponsor my show, oh, what do you get out of it? I'll give you a 30 second spot in it and that's it. Right. I, I gotta find out what I can do to work with that person there and help them out with some things. But but really and truly, it's content for me. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's a win-win situation for both of us and I try to create at the end of the day that my, that my sponsor feels like they're getting more out of it than they thought they were gonna get out of it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, 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 little things like, it's little things like that. And then on top of that is building relationships with other people too, building relationships with them that uh, they can benefit from it too, such as you've had him on your show before, Wesley Miller, yeah. Big Sasquatch. Well, he knows he wants to be, I mean, he, he knows what he can get out of it, but I'll send him videos back sometimes that I do with it. But Wesley doesn't need my help with anything. He has a big following out there already in doing it. But I just look for those different, unique places and people that are sort of, they're, they're contributors to my show. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny how that works. Like I've been doing, I've been in marketing now for seven years. Um, so, Yeah, about seven years. And it's funny how most people, you, you've been in this news and you know, information industry yeah. far longer than I have. But it's so funny how people can't seem to shift the mentality of there's always competition and that I shouldn't do things because I'm giving stuff away for free and mm -hmm. all that. Like every the, the landscape has changed, yeah. right? So it's now it's like, okay, I can do something that this person can benefit from and on the backside I'll benefit from it later. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Not not putting all my you know, putting everything up front and saying, okay, I'm gonna do this. What am I getting out of it immediately? And then let's give them something. You know, you see yeah. the scenario. Well, yeah, and there's an example for you. And 
not to or whatever, but you're asking about different things I do and all. And uh, if you follow us online and on my personal Facebook page, sometimes you see me post about it. So I'll pimp it here real quick. So, uh, you know, my wife and I, we have our Disney travel agency. Okay. Yeah. And so, uh, so, so we have it and we've been doing it for years. And my philosophy has always been with people. They come to us, they say, we want to go to Disney. And I can sit back and look at options and try to, to basically break it down to you. You got value, you got moderate, you got deluxe resorts. Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna make most of my commission off of it if I sell them a deluxe resort. But I want that person to be a return client. Exactly. I want that person to go on that trip and come back from that and say, you know what? Patrick did not try to go, or Kristen did not try to go and, and uh, you know, put me in the most expensive place they can make the most money off of. So I give them all the examples and I tell them, look, stay in a deluxe resort, this is what you're going to get out of it. How much of a difference is it staying in the deluxe and a moderate resort? I tell them, and I'm going to say, and I get the same reaction. I said, well, we're just going to be staying in our room sleeping. Okay, let's look at a moderate. Exactly. And then I say, well, you got a value down here with it and doing that. And I will tell them, but there are some differences there with it, how loud it is sometimes, you know, how old some of them are. But I, I break it down for them because I want to have that person. I'd much rather put that person in a moderate resort. I know I didn't make as much because really, the, you, probably the price is if the moderate cost a whole trip $4,000. The deluxe one's going to be seven to eight thousand dollars. So, but the odds are, if they take that one trip under the deluxe, they're not going to they take, may it, never take it again. Again, they may not come to you again yeah. or whatever. But if you do the moderate one, and then they feel like, okay, we're going to go back again in two years. So that's a return customer. Yeah, and uh, that's always been my philosophy with it. Uh, I do the same philosophy with. Uh, and whenever I used to really help out somebody with advertising, they'd go out and they'd say, how much is your budget? And they say, my budget's $10,000. And they say, okay, we're gonna spend $10,000 over two weeks. And yeah. I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, wait, no, 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 no. Why don't we take the $10,000 and spread it out over a period of time to find out what works best for you? Because that person I believe was like, when they realized if that was a good ten thousand dollars, they realized that person may not have really known what they were doing. Yeah. And then they dropped them real fast. But if you can get them to spend that $10,000 real fast, they can't drop you. Yeah. But you'll never see them again though. Yeah. That's I it. think that's important. I think it's important that everyone realizes that the 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 platforms have changed, the landscapes change, and the way people take in information has changed. And people value information differently because now we all have the ability to create information. You well, know, yeah, well, and, and broadcast it to the world, you know, oh, yeah. so it changes things and it changes the mentality and it changes how you de- have to deliver those messages. Mm-hmm. And it also changes the way people receive them. Yeah, and it used to be too, though, in television that TV just sold TV. Now, if you go to a TV station, they can help you with everything. Yeah, they got everything. Because yeah. they have to. Yeah, you have you, to be in business yeah. this day and age. You have to. You do your certain things that, that, that you do with your, your stuff. But you see, whenever, that, whenever somebody comes to the TV station, they know for a fact that there's a good chance that client now, if they understand the business, they're spending money over here with somebody with television. They might be spending money over here with somebody to do OTT. Yeah. They may be spending money over here with somebody to do uh, YouTube and mm-hmm. Google. Well, the reality of it is, that's fine. Somebody can spread their money out and do that. But you also got to be that one-stop shop. Yeah. But you got. But if you're going to be the one-stop shop, you do have to have knowledge. You got to know what you're doing. You know right, you're because that's going to be the biggest turnoff right there if mm-hmm. you do not do not have knowledge of it. And if you don't have knowledge of it, my philosophy has always been, admit it. Yeah. Don't do it because you're going to be discovered that you don't, and that's going to backfire on you. Yeah, you can. You can only BS so long. You know what I mean? It's <laughs> exactly. Like, it's kind of like long form conversation. It's like yeah. anybody can do a you know thirty second interview, but we're sitting down here and having a conversation mm-hmm. for an hour. We can't BS each other over right. an hour. You know, it's very, very hard to I do know. so. I know. Well, so with the uh, outdoor stuff, you've helped Dream Hunt Foundation uh-huh. too on some stuff. I think that's awesome. I think I think that it's in, like I think it's really awesome to be able to display what's going on, not only in this area, but like that trickles across the entire nation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I've enjoyed the time so far that I've done things with uh, Dream Hunt. They're a group that I look at as to a degree, I will call them a partner of the show, but I want to be a conduit of information for them to help them out, you know, spread the message about what they do. Jeff has done a fantastic job with it. You know, not just the hunts, but taking the kids out to fish, you know, he's expanding uh, as well. And I want to be able to share that story there with it. Uh, and so I want people to, and to a degree in a way, when they think of buy you outdoors 365 i want them sometimes to think of the dream hunt foundation and uh you know that that i'm helping to to get some of their stuff out there for people and it's not just that i try to get them coverage on television too and doing it i'm getting some partnerships i'm trying to look for some other partnerships so i can promote things whether or not it's through ducks unlimited 
or it is uh, through the uh, Hunters for the Hungry program that, uh, the, you know, they have different ones across the country and I'm working on trying to build a long-term partnership with the one in Louisiana to encourage people when they go hunting and they go deer hunting to donate one of their kills. That's a, that's a really great program. Yeah. Um, it is, um, I'm thinking there's a few, there's a few processors. I know there's one in Simsboro that accepts, um, I can't think of the name of that process right now, but I know there's a handful of processors that accept stuff, you know, across the, the they, nation. They, they do actually, uh, and there's certain ones, there's a sign on the outside yeah. of it. Uh, you know, Bellevue does Bellevue it. Does it. Bellevue then, does it. There's, there was another one randomly I didn't know that there, there's existed. O, there's one, was, there's one called about. Wild Thing Custom Meats. Wild Thing, yeah. They're over there in the Ada Taylor area. They do it. Now, you can go to the Hunters for the Hungry webpage, and it will show you at the top of their page uh, all the locations across the state of Louisiana that will accept it. And the cool thing about it is, typically, if I remember correctly, uh, and I know this way Gene does it as, at Wild Thing, is that you can you drop it off to them with it. They don't charge you anything. And, but though typically you can get the back strap back from it. <laughs> That's one of the things. Right. That, yeah. But but though then the rest of the meat is donated yeah. to it uh, for it. And, you know, like for occasions, you know, sometimes they may go to a food bank, but other times, though, it depends on where you are. Uh, they may if they have partnerships. So my example, I think Wild Thing, some of their food a lot of time will go to uh the Teen Challenge program that's based out of Camp Minden. Yep. And so it'll go there. Bellevue, a lot of times, some of their stuff will go to the rescue mission yeah. in, in Shreveport. And, uh, and you know, some places it will go to the to the food banks. And they, uh, they just did something this year, too, Hunters for the Hungry. Uh, they did something where they're trying, they say now they can accept in to be donated out uh, feral hogs. That's great. So I just had, um, I just had Michael Daniel on a couple weeks ago, and um, he's one of those I'm glad you said that because yeah. anyone that's listening or watching that has any contact with him or or I don't know if you know him, but I need to introduce yeah. you guys because he'd be great to shoot. Mm -hmm. um, he's basically going and eradicating these hogs for people. Okay. Um, and he's doing it all with thermal at night. Right. Which is awesome. I've been out, but, I've done thermal okay, before yeah. at night. So it's, uh, it's awesome and he's doing this stuff, but there's so many of those and um, there's, so, there's so many wasted. Mm -hmm. Whereas you could take that and if you don't want to mess with them, you just go deliver them right. there. You yeah. know? And that's huge. That's huge because it's great with deer, but a lot of people want to keep their deer. Mm -hmm. um, or there's people that just cut the back strap out right. and just waste it and you see yeah. them side of the road which is horrible right but with the hogs man it's it's something that they're such a nuisance and there's such an excess of them and like if we have people here that are in need of food and we can supply them with that with this why not you know make that connection exactly exactly and that they just started the program up and uh right now it's gotten a little too hot for it but the way it works is is technically if you kill the hog you need to get it to the processor within one hour yeah uh with it so the problem with that like a thermal hunt is it would be longer than that yeah. because it's nighttime so what a lot of people did with it they did a competition over with uh, the dubach deer factory in dubach louisiana okay where they encouraged people to do it but they set up they did hog traps and they, they would go out the next morning and they would fit the hogs there kill the hogs but they could take them directly to the processor after that and uh, so that's one of the things there, which has to go to a processor. So they make sure everything's okay with it. So yeah. it's, it's delivered there to them. But uh, but doing that, but that's a program too that I think whenever it gets cooler again, we're going to start promoting that one a little bit more. We did a little bit of promotion on it, but as soon as it got so hot, it was like nobody's going to go. Yeah, out you're not there. getting a hog there. Yeah, I mean, it's no, just... nobody's going to go and do, do it. But I've been out doing the nighttime thermal hog hunts. Uh, there's a gentleman, uh, Dale McPherson, down at a, out of the Frierson area. And uh, he has access to a bunch of land down there. And so we've gone out a couple of times and done them. I've been with some uh, game wardens in East Texas yeah. and uh, done, done it before. But uh, and th that's entertaining. But like I said, the problem of it is a lot of times you don't do it a lot during deer season. Yeah, you can't. And because, I mean, you're going to mess up your deer yeah. hunting if you yeah. do that. Uh, and But uh, but the problem of it is if you're going to do it, you can do it in the spring where it's not so hot. And some people do it in the summer, so they try to take care of things before deer season kicks in. But, I mean, right now, even that night, oh, right now, it's horrible. Right it would be miserable. Well, like, so let's circle back to something. I want to ask you, how does it, like, I remember growing up and watching, you know, you on the news or any people on the news. And I look at I looked at you guys as somewhat a celebrity. <laughs> uh, but how does that feel? Because I feel like you run into people, you probably run into people all the time. Yeah. Like, what did you think that that was going to happen when you got into, you know, just reporting the news and, and like reporting the weather? And like, how did it change? Because you went from like you were doing college radio and to going to TV. Like, how yeah. did that, sh that that shift of like almost star power? You know what I mean? Uh, you know, I, st I still don't really think much about it. I, I really don't. I mean, I, I, I and I never want to. Because I just want to be, uh, and I am personally, I mean, because I, I am, I'm just like everybody else is. 
Uh, I, I do know that there's going to be some people, though, that I've worked with in the past that it's gone to their head. <laughs> uh, but, you know, uh, but on the other hand, though, I just I, I try to act like that I'm nobody. Uh, it's, it's, it's really weird because I just, when I go into the store, I mean, I might look at somebody or not, but I don't look at them as saying, Hey, you know who I am, right? I, I don't do that. I just, I just don't want to be like that. I probably, if I acted like that, I may could have gotten myself a lot further sometimes too. Yeah. I just, I simply, I just don't know, uh, with it. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, pe people say, so we were actually at the movie, my wife and I went to the movie for the, we, we usually, if we go to the movie, we go to the movie, like during the morning or the afternoon just because we just it's weird i guess we just don't go out anymore but uh but she decided on saturday afternoon she goes she goes yeah she goes you want to go see the movie tonight mission impossible uh with it and uh, i said sure so we we're there in the line getting uh, concessions and we turn around and this older lady goes and says says, says she goes says i love you and all that and i said oh i said thank you and then, then she turns to my wife and she, she goes she goes I, I don't mean it like that i, I love watching them and uh but yeah it's 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 things like that i've had some strange things before i've uh been through drive through lines more than once uh I remember one time at a dairy queen up in benton years and years and years ago i don't think that dairy queen may not exist anymore i'm not even sure they're with it and lady i pull up in there lady in the drive through line she goes she goes, she goes she goes oh my gosh you're the guy on tv she goes autograph this for me and it's a uh, it's a, I think it was either, it was a napkin or it was a, uh, the paper like holder for French fries. <laughs> and she goes, yeah, I got one pinned up here for so-and-so sign it for me. So I had to autograph that for her. Yeah. I'm like, okay. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's things like that, but it's, I don't mean it, it hits once you start going on television and doing stuff, but uh, I just, I, I assume it's cause you know, there was a day where you assumed everybody watched television. Yeah, I mean they but, did, but they do, they don't today. No, they, that, they, which is which is interesting. But you you have just as big a following on social. You do, like, you do. You know, and what's interesting is like the amount of support in the metal. You know, conflict is almost the support overrides it still because you're you're still providing someone with the utility. Yeah, you know. It, yeah, it's 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 different nowadays. Your demographic, though, for the most part, as far as the age is concerned. It's an older age group that will say stuff to you out there because there are they are loyal watchers oh, still yeah. of television. Yeah. Uh, your younger group, there's some that watch, but some that don't. Some that are on social media, but they don't pay attention to new, to to, uh, to uh, news sites. That's the reason why my daughter's 22 and 25. I have a 22 year old. She uh, she works to deal with marketing and stuff like that for an international company that makes mining equipment. She's based out of Dallas, and like she just got out of college, just right there with a job and. Uh, she now says, Dad, she goes, she goes, okay, you need to do this with your outdoor show. You need to do that with your outdoor <laughs> show. And I did a, uh, I'm trying to get into other platforms, not to do crazy TikTok videos, right. but to do videos just for the weather forecast for the day. Simple things. I think it's out important. There that, so I did one yesterday for it. She sent it to me. She sent me, she goes, she goes, she goes, um, she goes I saw your TikTok video. Uh, she goes, it was a little janky, to be honest. <laughs> I responded back to her and I said, "You're mean." I said that hurt my feelings a little bit with it. And she goes, she goes, she goes, she goes, she goes I didn't mean it that way with it. She says it was just how you had the uh, the stuff placed on the screen, stickers or whatever, whatever it placed on the screen and different things, the way it was covered and all. And I was just like, "Okay, thanks, Anna." And so, uh, but that was just her. But she's trying to tell me how to do things, and so I'm trying to trying to see if I can find a place out there uh, for it for the show for weather i mean even our travel agency there's a place out there for, for that yeah there, i think it's important to, to cover every platform what would you what would you tell like young people who may want to get into meteorology like how to, how what turn around and run no, <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i mean you've seen you've seen the entire landscape change so I, you know yeah. so like what would you tell them you know over all these years of what you've been doing it how many total years have you been doing good grief uh i started my first job here in town full-time job okay and uh 95 okay so we're working on almost we're 28 years yeah, 28, 28 years. years now you know i'm gonna say first of all and i'm being very honest with it with it i mean we need young people to have an interest in meteorology we need a diversity in it also uh we need people of all different types of backgrounds because uh you know it's just something that we're lacking on it uh we're lacking uh whether or not it's you know other uh you know minority groups doing it uh like that but though we're also lacking females in it too 
Yeah. And so uh, this is what's interesting. We just hired a uh, new uh, young lady. Her name is Caroline Castora. She's originally from Plano, Texas. She graduated with a degree in meteorology from Penn State. And I've been uh, working with her. And I don't want to use the word training her. I'm training her in certain areas, but I'm trying to be more of a mentor to her. She's super smart. She has a lot of talent there. I mean, there's always, she's green in certain areas. So I want her to improve on them. But uh, I just don't want her to get discouraged because this is the other problem with social media. People are mean. Yeah. I mean, this young lady is doing a tremendous job. And the very first night I put her on the air with me, I just, I got a horrible email from somebody. I don't mind saying that here. A person probably not watching your thing at yeah. all with it. I got that email two days in a row and it was sent directly to Caroline. It was horrible. And I'm just like, I do not understand people. But the point of saying this is, is don't get discouraged. And sometimes don't ignore the haters out there because you know, if you've watched things, the the vocal group usually only represents 10% of what people actually think. Yeah. The, the, the quiet is the majority. Yeah. So don't get discouraged by it. But though I have another uh, young lady, 20 years old, uh, her name's Brooke and she actually goes to Texas A&M and she wants to get into meteorology. And so she's been up at the TV station, some watching me some this summer. Uh, the th uh, thing of it is being a meteorologist doesn't make you a nerd. Uh, you know, but, but having an interest with the weather and caring about people and all, that's where it is. And some people, my wife will go say sometimes to me, she goes, she goes, she goes is your job safe? And I go, what do you mean? Well, you know, sometimes TV stations are going under. I said, when's the last TV station we saw go under here? We haven't. Well, yeah, but you know, AI is going to take over it. And I go, AI cannot take over a job where you actually need a human being interpreting the, da the data that the computer's putting out. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, you know, so I'm not, I'm not discouraged with that, but anybody out there, you know, I would encourage the person to just observe the weather, learn about the weather, try to do internships at places, learn about different things, but your career may not take you to television. There's great people working at the national weather service office. I know a lot of them out there. They have great jobs. There's a lot of private sector what about jobs. Storm chasing too. That's a, have you ever done that? Uh, like I know you've done it. Like you've been, no, I mean, but like, what, <laughs> there's like not, a really, there's like a really specific demographic of people that that do that, and they they have huge followings on social media. Well, probably number do. the number one one is Reed Timmer. Yeah, uh, you know, and if I, I know this sounds very weird, but I think that way back in the day, Reed made a name for himself. I, if I remember correctly, and all, and I, and I could be completely wrong on this. Reed made a name for himself the same year that we had the Benton tornado. Yeah. There was a tornado that hit in May, in the month of May, uh, 1999. It was 99 or 2000 with it, but hit back then and hit uh, Oklahoma City. And to this day, there might have been a different one, but at that time it was the, it was the largest tornado as far as wind speed ever documented. And the cool thing about it was where it was in Oklahoma, Unfortunately, though, being de deadly, though, but they were actually able to get out at the time storm chasing vehicles with mobile Doppler radars on it. I want to say Reed was a student at the time at Oklahoma, uh, uh, University of Oklahoma. And so he was uh, up there. And so another kid that was doing an internship at the TV station, I believe, knew Reed. So to do a piece on the anniversary of the tornado, I went up to Oklahoma and they took us out to the spot where they were, where the tornado came through and all that. And I think like for Reed after that, I mean, he became known and everything with it. And he's probably one of the most well-known storm chasers in the country. Yeah, and I'd like to do it, but you know what? Right here, it's weird when I say this, the Arkla Tex is not a place to storm chase. We have too many trees. Yeah, you can't, there's not open fields where you can be, you, you can see you know, and, the path and, or anything. And even though people think we're flat, we're not flat. We do have rolling hills. The place to storm chase is North Texas into Oklahoma, into Kansas, the flat area of the yeah. country. So you can see that storm coming miles away. Uh, but remember, if, if anybody ever encounters a storm or sees it, it's not like the movie Twister, where you're gonna go experience a tornado and live through it five different times <laughs> and be on the inside of it. But uh, you know, but take opportunities to learn things if you if you wanna do stuff, but don't become your own storm chaser here. Just don't do it. I was working one time, uh, for a station, not the station I'm currently working for. And it was, it was like, oh, we had this vehicle. We want you to take it out and all and go storm chase. And I go, uh, no, <laughs> I said, I said, I said, uh, I am not qualified to storm chase with it. And, uh, the vehicle wasn't fully ready for it. And I'm not putting my life in danger and especially not at nighttime. Yeah. And so that's just, uh, I'm like, I'm not going to do that. 
Well, let's talk about one. I'm going to talk about one more thing. Let's talk about the phenomenon and the um, conspiracy of this bark still bubble. And the people who are listening or watching who are not from the Northwest Louisiana area, um, there's there, there's something that basically around we have a huge Air Force base here, and they basically say that there's a bubble that they can turn on and off to deflect weather. Right. What's your what's your thoughts on well, this? What's, what's the funny <laughs> part about that is as soon as I go and say everybody knows it's not true, but at the same time there's this day and age yes there's probably people that think it is true um and by the way too are there ways to alter weather of course there's ways to alter weather cloud seeding things like that and doing stuff uh i just don't think we have the ability to turn on a bubble though and all of a sudden <laughs> block it block it all out um uh, so uh there's a thing like say called barksdale bubble and because and the reason it's there is because you know we see storms coming in then all of a sudden the storms fall apart or sometimes some people love showing radar imagery and says, you see this right here, you know, do that. That's because I want to say you do know you're looking at a radar image that is either like a composite image or there's different things for it. And I'd like, I'm, I just don't take, sometimes like, don't, don't explain it, Patrick, just move on. <laughs> so here's where when people bring this up, uh, this is what I explain to them. Uh, a lot of times, not always, storms form, storms form out in West Texas they form along what we call the dry line. And a dry line is a separation of hot, dry air and hot, moist air. Well, as time goes along, the storms are moving towards our area and they get over into East Texas. And we see them coming, we see them coming, we see them coming, then all of a sudden, they just fall apart. A lot of times they fall apart at night. Well, think about it. We've lost our daytime heating going on. But the other thing is too, is that as that storms moving to East Texas, the dry line, Retreats. The dry line doesn't keep moving with it. The dry line goes back and forth, back and forth. It'll only go all the way through if by chance it's an actual front that pushes them all the way through. But they get here to East Texas and they fall apart. But then all of a sudden, a few hours later or the next morning comes up and then all of a sudden they pop back up again. And they pop back up, let's say, towards uh, Ruston, yeah, down towards right. Natchitoches, and they move off to the east. That wasn't an activation <laughs> of the Barksdale bubble or anything like that. Those storms left one environment and then what we call an outflow boundary. It's basically an outflow boundary. It's not an imaginary. It's it's like a uh, sort of like a little cool front that got left behind that's floating around in the atmosphere. And then what happens is that dry line retreats, and then we have this big body of water down the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, and what it we have coming out of it a few thousand feet in the air is what we call the low level jet stream. Well, it's kicking in. Well, it flows up across areas of Louisiana a lot of times. What's happening here is those storms start to lose their energy and they start dying out, but that boundary's still moving. It still might be raining some with it. Then all of a sudden, boof, it kicks in with that low-level jet stream and those storms get a new source of energy. And then all of a sudden they reignite once again and they form. So it's not so much about the Barksdale bubble. It is more about location, location, location. We are the area of Louisiana, Texas state line, we are in between two different environments whenever it comes to things that energize the weather. And it's basically a rebirth zone or however it is you want to call it. But that's that that's my philosophy on it. And I think a lot of people in meteorology would agree that that's the reason why we see a lot of storms fall apart. But it's also the time of the day because a lot of storms in the dry line develop in the afternoon and then they get into our area towards 11 o'clock midnight, 1 a.m. in the morning and they fall apart. Why? They lost daytime heating also. So it's all kinds of variables there. But it's all fun for people to talk about the Barksdale bubble. It is. And I, and I joke about it sometimes. But I think, I think it's also fun for like, you just literally educated me on the entire thing within a minute. So I give you permission to take that clip and use that on your TikTok because okay. I think that's what you need to be doing on TikTok, man. I think that it's ex like you like the TikTok viewers like they they want to they use that thing to like, either learn dances or learn information, yeah. learn financial information. And I think there's not enough people out here educating people about these things and people can make fun of stuff and and throw, you know, things around like that, yeah. but like knowing the root cause and why it's going on, I think it's extremely important. Well, and, and that's the reason too, part of it is we see storms sometimes move down from Oklahoma and it's like, why do those storms fall apart? And it's just, it's in the environment that you're in at the time. It, it is always interesting to me, especially with these summer storms coming in, that they'll seem to hit, they'll come in from Oklahoma, seem to hit Texarkana, and then it, it's like they have a trajectory and then for some reason they start turning well, and go north of us into well, south, southern Arkansas. It has, it, it has to do with a, a variety of reasons there, and it's done that a lot lately, but part of that has to do with the fact that 
it's getting down here and there's a frontal boundary that stretches across our area oriented from the west to the east. So as those storms come down, they interact with that front. That then that, that front is like a road. It's like a stationary. It's a stationary. It's like where it hits that front, it turns, and then they travel along the front. You can see it every – like I, I watch it all I the time. Know. I don't know why I'm fascinated with radar, but when anytime weather's coming, I'll look at it and I'll say, okay. And, I, and especially here lately because it's been like – clockwork every week yeah so i've been watching i'm like look at this trajectory it looks like i said but i bet it's gonna and i'll be damn it hits right there yeah. and it just travels along the north the north part of the state and i'm like this is crazy how that works and i do think that so many people like how do you how do you convey that to people sometimes especially like trying to simplify a message and get it out there like i think you're really i think you're really really good at getting a lot of information out in a short amount of time and that's probably due to doing news so yeah. long that you have to get compress all this in there but like how how do you do you try to educate or throw nuggets in there to, to educate people on what's going on and like so they know maybe like moving forward when they see yeah. a scenario what they need to do? Right. I mean, so, some sometimes I do. It really depends upon you know what's going on on that one particular day. Whenever it comes to the weather taking place, uh, sometimes it's uh, other days. It's uh, you know we we have an arsenal full of templates that we can use things that work to try to educate people on uh, s certain stuff going on. Uh, my biggest thing is right now is try to educate people on why we're seeing the weather patterns that we're seeing right now, the upper ridge out to the west and seeing yet, yeah, why does it get so hot? Why are they hotter than us? Why is it, for example, we also have out to the west, we're like, that's a dry heat. Funny thing is I looked the other day and I said, uh, I said Death Valley had a temperature of 120 degrees. We had a temperature of 98 degrees. Death Valley at 120 degrees has a heat index of 109 exactly. because of how dry it is. We have a heat index of 112. And so I jokingly said on the air, I think at the time it was 109. So I said on the air, I said, so reality of it is we feel just as hot as it is out in Death Valley, California. Uh, but, you know, I, tr I try to educate people on certain things with it. Uh, don't, I mean, I don't want to spend my entire time doing it. But I try to show them different types of weather going on. Like, for example, the big topic that's taking place too right now is Canadian wildfires and the smoke coming down from them. So we have a news story talking about them. I said, so what can I do? I pull up a map that shows the Canadian wildfires, uh, you know, where the smoke is. I look at the air quality index levels, different areas. And I say, oh, I'll tell you what, I'm going to take you live right now to a tower cam because we have access to tower cams across the country and even Canada. I'm going to take you live to Canada. And we're going to look at the air, meaning that it, I wasn't where the fires were, but I could see the smoke in the air. And so it's little things like that to try to uh, educate, but also have fun, you know, sometimes talk about odd weather events going on. I, I look every day to see what the national day of is to see if I can make a joke about yeah. it on the air and uh, just, just just little things like well, that. Well, I think it's I just think weather's fascinating and it's so funny how we are a minuscule speck on this planet. Yeah. And at any given time mother nature can wipe us out. Oh yeah, it can. Like in it, without any any indication, you know, like maybe someone like you will have a little bit of, you know, preparation, mm -hmm. you know, and know, hey, this is coming, but like it is just fascinating to me that no matter we're, we're controlled by the elements and we're you yeah know. there's somebody yesterday in an interview and i understand their frustration with it they were just talking about the power outages and stuff and you know and i think they were halfway griping about their power is always going out and things and i'm like you know from the little time i've worked at swepco with it uh they there's a lot of good people there everything's not perfect when it comes you know to infrastructure in different places get that but this year it's it's not their fault this year it's nature yeah and there's absolutely nothing we can do about it no, there's nothing no, there's nothing you can do I other mean, than like try to prepare and protect yourself i mean there's there's there, there's there's nothing we can do do with it i mean the headlines are all out this year whether or not it's here in the u.s it's over in europe i mean we are we i think to a degree we we, we are having extreme weather conditions but also remember this too it's like we've never covered the weather like we've covered it in the past. You it's are. like somebody says, man, can you see all the tornadoes we're having this year? And by the way, I'm just using that as an example. It's like, are we really having more tornadoes? Or are we have more people that are video recording the tornadoes uh, and we're reporting them? Very, very good point. It's, I think that's an extremely good well, point. Well, it's like the same thing too, is that when we use the terminology and we say the hottest day of the year, another record got broken today. Okay, but question for you. So a hundred years ago, how many thermometers did we have around the globe versus how many do we have right now? 150 years ago. Oh, by the way, official observations, official observations in a lot of places in the U.S. have only documented back to the late 1800s. So again, what are you relying this on? But I, I'll go back. I do believe weather goes in cycles. Uh, we'll have different periods of time with it. Uh, and two, also remember there's a difference between climate and weather. 
Weather is what we have going on on an everyday basis, but the climate is what you look at that overall big picture of how things are uh, with it. But we all need to take a step back sometimes and realize that we do have an impact on stuff. We do. How extreme it is, I don't know the answer right. to that. But, you know, if there's some common sense things to do, then why not do it instead of arguing about it sometimes as well? <laughs> You're making it a part of an agenda that has no, absolutely nothing to do with oh, anything gotcha. other than the well-being of everyone. You no. know what I mean? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I think that's the problem in this day and age when it comes to almost everything in our life, too. Everybody has an agenda. Yeah, yeah. And you see it in almost every story these days that's – I don't want to say every story that's done these days – Stories that are done on uh, certain broadcast entities. Yeah. We'll, 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 yeah. And that's on both extremes there yeah. with, with it. Well, what I wanted to ask you one more thing. Um, the Saharan, remember that Saharan dust? Yep. That that was f like, for some reason, whenever I heard about that and then saw it, I was like, this is the most, it was crazy, mm -hmm. but also fascinating to me. So how did that, how does that even happen? How does that travel that far? And we can still see powerful it. jet stream winds. That's insane. Yeah, and it, the funny part what about it. What year was that? Was that like two years ago? Or something? Well, no, it's still out there. Okay. Matter of fact, that reminds me. I was watching a presentation yesterday, and I, I'm not really sure if that was new stuff or not. I'm going to double check it today. But oh yeah, the Saharan dust is still out there, no matter what. It's just it becomes sometimes more dominant how it flows all the way across the ocean. I mean, it's all interrelated with each other. I mean, it, the, the the think of the atmosphere as just a flowing river of air. And it is just as powerful as the ocean is. And if if you put if you put certain things in the water, they're going to flow all the way across. But how does it stay? I would say, I guess, afloat. I guess it's like staying afloat. It is. Like it travels. So, from, it makes so, it that far. It's without, so minuscule, though. It's yeah. so tiny. It's not like picking up sand, perhaps there at the beach. Right. The, these are these are just so tiny. It's I mean, it could be floating around us right now. We wouldn't feel it, perhaps. But though sometimes though it does reach the ground whenever it gets caught up in the rain and it when it comes down to the ground, it makes your car dirty and muddy. And we've had that happen here before. Uh, but it comes all the way across now, and now we have the ability and the technology to track it. We know whenever it gets caught up in there, and it's good and bad. I mean, it can give you some poor air quality does and it, stuff. Does it affect the weather? Any? Yes, it does. Okay. It actually can it, what suppress context? hurricane formation. Really? Yes. Why is that? It just gets Does it like out. create a, like a field, like a, a force field or something? <laughs> well, I mean, it, it do a variety of things. Number one, it filters out the sun a little bit there with it. And, you know, uh, and I'll be truthfully honest with you. This one thing, I haven't studied it enough with it, but they do say the experts when it comes to hurricanes and stuff say with it that uh, it can have an impact on hurricane formation. The Saharan dust can. I mean, there's a variety of things because I was actually watching a, uh, a presentation on a hurricane stuff for our weather computer system and uh yeah, it was really it was an interesting presentation to watch but people don't realize i mean it's like saying why aren't we seeing hurricanes and blah 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 because it takes a the perfect it's like i could have lined up here the perfect ingredients right now for a cake and if i don't mix them right but they all go together throw it in that oven it's not going to come out looking like anything like look like same thing for a hurricane we have the right ocean temperature. We have the right low-level shear in the storm. We, I mean, all the other varieties of information that we have there with it could all be present in the ocean. But if they're not all present together at the exact same time, the exact same location, it's not going to happen. Yeah. And uh, so it's fascinating to learn a bit more about that when it comes to hurricanes. Uh, but yeah, Saharan dust has an impact on it, and it's a fascinating thing to watch. I just thought like, it was cool. Like I had no idea, and it was maybe a year like or two ago. And then I, yeah, so yeah, we're getting this Sahara dust come through here, and then I look outside. I'm like, holy shit! That's I can literally see how like yeah, you know, brown it is covering well, this like, entire area. It's like the smoke from the Canadian fires, though. They are Canadian fires there with it, and, and if yeah. I, I had uh, the past few days of projections on it, that well, these are historical stuff coming all the way down to the U.S. And what it's doing is following the jet stream. Yeah, that's all it's doing is following the jet stream, and it's it's looping down and all with it. Now, granted, if we all of a sudden get a powerful jet stream, not powerful one, but a one that directs that picks a huge dip and dives straight from there down south to the Arklatex, then guess what? We might actually see smoke from the Canadian fires this far south. Be awesome. uh, you know, but it's not a good thing. That's not, going not a on, good, but, but it's still like, and I think it's funny, like when you're growing up and you're learning all this stuff, like you're learning like the, the jet streams, how it cro moves across the globe yeah. and all that. It just, you just kind of glaze over, you know, until you see a scenario where it's like, oh, okay, now I understand. Now this makes sense of how this affects this. You know well, what I mean? They all do. There, and there's, there's rivers of air, like it all across the world. And I've been doing presentations at schools. I talk to them about, you know, different things about the weather and what guides the weather and all. And, and I say something about, I say, this is the jet stream. I say, y'all know what the jet stream is? And I said, do you know how the jet stream was discovered? 
and I say go back to is World War One or World War Two, where uh, the pilots and all were flying planes, and they soon realized the predominant jet stream usually is traveling for us in the U.S. from the west to the east, and it's like they discovered that when they traveled west, it took them longer, but when they traveled east, it was a shorter trip. And if you've ever traveled across the U.S. before. Look at your flight time the next time. If you're yeah. traveling from here to L.A. and if L.A. back to here, your trip from L.A. back to here is going to be a shorter trip usually. Yeah, if it. you just drive from here to West Texas, yeah. you'll notice that like you're going to get wind the entire time yeah. against you versus. Well, yeah, that, yeah, and so, but like I said, that whenever you get up there, thirty thousand feet up in the yeah. air, those are rivers of air coming through there, and those things are what guides our weather. Uh, it might be one thing here at the surface, but the big picture weather pattern is guided by those jet stream winds. The upper level ridge, jet stream winds out there to the west with it. Uh, and then underneath it, certain weather happens. But weather is not just here at the surface. It's multidimensional. What are the differences in, in miles per hour? Like, so if you're looking at like in the jet, like in the in the middle of the jet stream, yeah. I'd say at X amount of feet versus here at planet yeah. like level. What is the, what you're, the you're doing, you're, uh, up there? It could be 100 miles an hour. Hundreds. Really? Oh, yeah. Because it it's, I'll give you an example, too. Like there's been storms and radars can detect this also. Like when we're looking at severe thunderstorm winds, uh, a radar can beam up into that uh, thunderstorm and detect a wind of like uh, the, the night we had 80 mile an hour winds come through here, 80 to 90. They were detecting 120 mile an hour winds or 100 to 120. It might be, might be 100, but 100 to 120 just about uh, I want to say a thousand feet in the air. And I was like, and those winds will transition and come down to the ground. Now they may not always be that strong right. there with it, but, uh, oh yeah, the, the, the jet stream itself. I mean, it's, it's, it's powerful. It's, it's, it's like a river current. And, uh, you know, it's, it's I, the other example I used before, did you see the movie finding Nemo? Oh yeah. I, yeah. Years so, ago. So, yeah. So finding Nemo has the scene with, uh, with crush the turtle and uh and he, and so they and so ne, uh they're uh, nemo's hanging out with them and he needs to get somewhere and they tell him and i forget what the term what the name of it was but he basically jumped into this yeah, yeah faster yeah. thing that's yeah like, that's like the jet stream is okay gotcha there's different areas in the jet stream there that's faster so if you were way up in the air with it you might have light winds but if you jumped over you're going to take off okay and that's we have those same currents in the ocean just like we do up there if you probably looked right now at your ocean currents your big picture ocean current versus compare those to the uh i mean with the dominant ocean currents with the dominant winds above they're almost going to match up with each other that's crazy it is it's crazy to they, think di about. they dictate with each other well look man it's been a good time um we got to do this again soon okay because i'm i'm gonna become a nerd over there <laughs> I, I, I enjoy stuff. it i enjoy it man good, i enjoy good, it but good. i appreciate your time any last plugs anything you want to mention no nope, just about? uh you know uh, you can follow me uh on facebook there uh by you outdoors 365 i'm seen locally if you're in the area on saturday mornings at 6 a.m on kpxj cw21 that's our sister station to ktbs uh, the TikTok thing I'm doing. What is it called? It's called Weatherman Patrick. Man, do it, do it. It's bro. called Weatherman Patrick. Educate them. Uh, so Weatherman Patrick there. Uh, again, we're going to hopefully start doing that up. And we'll also keep a track. We might do some separate things too. So we have a new mascot for the outdoor show. Her name is uh, Olive and she is a uh, chocolate lab. And she actually came from a breeder over in Claiborne Parish, just uh, just to the east of us here. So she's going to be featured a whole lot. We're going to feature her training that she's about to be going through uh, also. And so we have uh, that. And then, two, if anybody's looking for a Disney trip, all about Mickey vacation planning. <laughs> <All> right, <man. laughs> Sounds good, bro.